Welcome back to the Beat the Often Path podcast, where I showcase unusual success stories to help us all think outside the box. The old saying is, it takes twice the person to ride half the bike. So today we're representing unicyclists everywhere with my guest, the general manager of Unicycle.com, Joshua Torrens. Unicycle.com is where I bought my first unicycle many, many years ago. I was always super cool, didn't you know? And today they're a thriving e-commerce store that serves the unicycling community. Joshua is extremely passionate about what he does, and this episode is proof that you can build a sustainable business around your hobby and passion. So with that, here's Joshua Torrens of Unicycle.com. Welcome to the podcast, Josh. Thank you. Uh, glad to have you here. Um, so the idea behind this podcast, and I think you'll understand why I wanted you on, is yeah. unusual success stories. So I'm trying to find people who found their own path, literally, metaphorically. In your case, I think it's a combination of both. Um, to help people think outside of the box, to get some new ideas, my theory here is that a lot of the old paths or traditional paths are breaking down or don't really work anymore or as well. So there's a degree of creativity that has to happen to kind of make it in this new world. That's my premise. So <laughs> you, being the manager of Unicycle.com, is something that goes way back to my childhood because I think I bought my first unicycle from Unicycle.com when I was probably about 16 years old. And I'm going to turn 35 here in a couple weeks. Nice. So it's a pleasure to have you on board. So, you know, <clears throat> tell you. us a little bit about what you do and, and the company. It, yeah, kind of to give you a start. So you have Unicycle.com. They started their, their brief history in a nutshell uh, was John Drummond, the founder of Unicycle.com, worked for IBM at the time. And IBM, being the big muscle they are when it comes to computers, had little website stuff. And John is a unicyclist amongst other loves of, of you know, like banjos and whatnot. So he made a little informational site because as he was riding his unicycle back and forth from work, uh, commuting, people would ask him about it. And he's like, hey, if people have these questions, other people will probably want to know. So he made a resource with kind of the idea of reselling, but not even completely there. And then as he got to the point where he was starting to resell unicycles of other brands and, and whatnot, it really started picking up steam. And during that time frame, I believe IBM was doing a little bit of shakedown stuff. And John was on that list of shakedown stuff and ended up uh, getting let go of his job. So wow. Unicycle was kind of, you know, full tilt and, and ready to rock and roll. And then I believe it was roughly 2002, John had the idea, hey, if I start you know, unicycle going well. If I cookie cutter that into banjo.com, maybe I could do a couple of companies and maybe do some more and then kind of build this structure of, hey, we get somebody going with this stuff, this, this line, we'll start another company and cookie cutter it because a dot com is a dot com. If you're early in on it, unicycle.com, you know, that's priceless right. now here 20 right. something years later. Um, so, when that happened, then Amy, his wife, um, now ex-wife, but um, got kind of stepped in and started managing unicycle.com so John could take over banjo.com. And so um, you fast forward 2004, uh, I got the interest of riding mountain bikes and I have been riding in the bicycling, I would say since 1994. Uh, cycling as transportation as a kid and being serious about doing mileage and other events and stuff like that. Then I started working in the bicycle industry roughly around 97 with a little breaks here and there due to military and whatnot. Then uh, being a welder, I got hit by a truck uh, when I was commuting 37 miles one way back. Those are related work. somehow. <laughs> because um, you're a yeah, welder, you yeah. got hit by a truck. <laughs> yeah, I got hit by a truck on a bicycle, mind you, oh, commuting. I'm and so sorry to hear that. That's awful. Oh, well, it was actually a blessing, believe it or not. Okay, so okay. I had three months off, and I was working with a bunch of people that hated their jobs but were making awesome money. And I said, you know, it's an okay job. It's a great skill, but I want to do something that I really love and enjoy. So after brainstorming, I was like, you know what? I had the most fun. I still cycle. I had the most fun when I worked at a bike shop. And so going forward, I ended up doing some other stuff, 
while I was waiting for a position to open up at a local bike shop. Then I slid into there. Then fast forward to 2004. So I've been wrenching for a long time and, you know, building wheels and whatnot. I went riding with a guy um, that I was good friends with and he had a unicycle from that he borrowed from somebody and he said, hey, check this thing out. And I hopped on it. And after about 10 minutes, I had that, oh, I almost had it, I think. And, it, yeah. and, and with the unicycle, it's that harsh learning curve. So if you remotely feel that feeling, you're going to chase it until you get it. Um, I mean, it's definitely got that harsh learning curve, but after that, it's relative. So after about a half hour, I was able to go probably the length of a vehicle and before I had an unplanned dismount, as we call it. And so then I started, then I started, I was like, let me buy a unicycle. So not knowing anything about unicycles, uh, profile racing, they made a really high end crank set for unicycles. Well, they made a 26 inch unicycle and me like other customers that I help every day. I was like, I ride a 26 inch mountain bike. I guess I need a 26 inch unicycle. So I bought that not knowing what I really bought at the time. And it was a downhill level unicycle from, you know, all the parts and whatnot. So, um, Then it kind of caught like wildfire. I bought that unicycle, started learning in Christmas. And then two months later, I'm buying a 36 uh, from unicycle.com. And of course, me being at the bike shop, uh, unicycle.com offers dealers, uh, you know, pricing for resale so they can actually support the community if there is a unicyclist in that community. And so I talked my boss at that time into carrying unicycles. And it was funny, the first time I ordered a $700 retail unicycle to sell in the store, my boss was like, the, uh, I don't know if I agree with that. And I told him, I said, okay, if we don't sell it in three months, I will buy it retail from you because as, as a makeup. And he said, okay, that's fine. We'll let it hang on the wall. It sold a month later because I was mm. hustling that bad boy. Right. <laughs> of course you were. Um, so, so then um, you fast forward a little bit more. And in 2007, I ended up having 14 unicycles, one of each size. I talked profile racing into uh, pressing in a titanium spindle um, into their hub to just bring it the next level up. By that time, they were doing anodized runs in different colors. I owned one of each hub color for each size. So I like had overkill freestyle unicycle that had like a turquoise profile racing hub all the way up to uh, it would be 29. And then my 36, I actually bought from unicycle.com a Schlumpf uh, two-speed hub um, that is a one by one fixed hub. And then it goes by one and a half. So I had that hub in a 29 inch frame, that frame design had a crack in it while I was waiting for it to be warranted. I was looking at some of our parts on our wall and we had a Nimbus 36 frame on the wall. I was looking at my 36 and I was kind of looking at the, at my 29 wheel just sitting there and I'm like, I'm going to rebuild the wheel. So I rebuilt the wheel, mapped out the spokes. I had a tool to cut the spokes and roll the threads in. So I was capable to be totally crazy and lace this thing up. Now through the forum, the unicyclist.com forum, which is actually still going today. It's a great resource for a community. Yeah, and I was on there um, in the early I, days. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, it's still going. Thankfully they re cool. they rebrand, they kind of refreshed it and it's, it's awesome. So as far as I could track, I was the second 36 er in the U S uh, okay. with the Shlump hub. There was another guy that was in California that I think might've beat me or we were there about the same time. Um, so when I had all those unicycles bought a little four by six foot trailer and went to, um, they had nationals and AUCC, um, in Saline, Michigan or Ypsilanti, Michigan, cause they're kind of the same and met Amy and John in person for the first time. And I've always been helping out with different events. So to go to an event and participate, I'm not used to it because of what I do for bicycles and the bike industry. So I naturally saw they needed help, started helping them do some stuff, started, you know, doing some mechanical stuff, bleeding brakes and whatnot. And then after the second night, Amy and John were like, let's have a talk. So in true unicycle.com fashion at three o'clock in the morning, we're sitting at a conference table inside a Marriott residence Inn, and they're saying, Hey, we have an idea for you. We don't have a position yet, but we think we need somebody like you to work for the company. Would you be interested in being 
uh, unicycle.com general manager. And this would be a position that we would grow around, around everything. And, and, you know, that was kind of the start of how, my cue into the company. Well, so, that's awesome. So, and, and what year was that that you started? That was 2007. Okay. And, so, and yeah. that, what, that would be September of 2007. And then, Oh, that was a, I stepped right in and kind of was guns a blazing as I stepped into the company. Um, I did, a, I'm really good with, you know, inventory management. And since I have a lot of expert, you know, history in building wheels, I didn't really build wheels in the beginning. We actually had a great uh, wheel builder, John Cavacci. And, um, but the warehouse needed some, had some dead stock. So we would build up cycles, map the parts out to move some of the dead stock because it was good product. It's just people weren't looking to buy that aftermarket. So we would put it into a cycle. We would name it, take pictures and, and, you know, be able to sell a complete product that somebody would be able to enjoy. So we did a lot of that inventory management stuff. We had a couple of employees working, I think it was uh, two full-time employees. And then at that time, unicycle.com was about educating people regardless of where they were at. So we did a work to school program through the local high school. So we had, I think about four part-time kids that would come in and prep the cycles. They would check the nuts and the bolts, put the left and right stickers on the, you, yes, you can cut the seat post down with a hacksaw or a pipe cutter, you know, sticker on the seat post. And and really, that's where they audit if there was something wrong with it, then you tag that box. And then uh, one of us three that worked full time or Amy or John would actually inspect that cycle and say, what is the problem with this cycle? Let's replace it. Let's fix it. OK, this is an issue. Then we need to talk to the manufacturer. So um, as that as I kind of slid into that position, that was initially what I did. And then I slowly moved into doing the warranty um, and you know, the receiving. And so the first March I was with the company, which would have been 2008, um, I went to Taiwan and that's where um, Nimbus is manufactured out of Taichung, Taiwan. They have the big Taiwan bike show. So we're uh, a, a division of the bicycle industry. So all the stuff we use is bicycle industry related. It's the right. cranks and the hubs are really unicycle specific and seat post and saddles, of course. Um, the and and now I can say the frames are a hundred percent adapted for unicycles, but they're made by the same companies that make you bicycle forks and bicycle frames. So once I went to that, then we came back from Taiwan um, my first year, and of course I was awestruck. I was going to go ride and take my unicycle over to get to ride with Roger Davies. Um, he's the engineer of unicycle.com for, you know, product development. We all work together as a team, but he's the one that is the most important when it comes to communicating, putting it on paper and communicating those dimensions and everything with the factories. And so um, when, uh, when we got back, then I started prepping for what was known as Ride the Lobster. It was the Tour de France of unicyclists. It only happened <laughs> one year, unfortunately, and that was June. So it was like as soon as I got into, you know, literally slid in and started working for unicycle.com, it was like bam, bam, bam for tripwise. And then we had nationals, which I can't remember what year, mm -hmm. but where we were at nationals that year, my, you know, my gut instinct is it was probably Madison or it was uh, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities area, because they have a very robust freestyle program and club very active there are some other active groups out there but minneapolis was at, during that time frame probably one of the largest in the u.s so super cool then then uh we started doing like product development i'm more in uh, i'm i'm involved in every aspect of the company um i guess a true general manager we do have franchises and the franchises are actually individually owned and operated but they give us buying power. So if we want to have a tire, for instance, I don't know if you've been on our site and you saw the 32 inch unicycle, that was the 32 inch bicycle was designed by Kent Bicycles. And it was at Costco and a handful of places that it was like a novelty, mm. like the 36 or, or like the 36 or was originally. And I had a customer send me two rims and tires. And he was like, hey, if you build me one, 
I'll give you the other one to check out. And I built it up and I was like, oh, this is great. It's a fast unicycle, but it handles like a 29. Hmm. And, and, and so I was like, there's a market for this. Well, we can do everything. We can do rim extrusion through Nimbus branding because Nimbus is our house brand, one of our many house brands. Um, making the fork is easy. We have all the other stuff. The tire is the hardest part, the tire and the hmm. tube. So once we found a company that would work with our lower numbers, like 300 pieces at a time versus 10,000 at a time, like what sure. Maxis or Kenda would want, um, then we were able to make that cycle. And a lot of people were like, oh, that's a slow 36. And I'm like, no, it's not a slow 36. It's a fast 29. <laughs> Where a 36, you hop, I don't know if you've ridden one, but you hop on that in thing. Fast, yeah, it's a beast. It's like it's like a bull in a china shop. You're along for the ride, and yeah, you yeah. have to be comfortable with the with the delay or a the lot of momentum there. Exactly. Where the where that that 32 inch, you know, you can hustle, and as long as you're not trying to stay up with other 30 or in 36ers, you know, you're golden. Um, and then kind of to slide into the, the, the branding. Um, we used to carry sun while well, we still carry sun. We used to carry Torker, which has now been bought out by Raleigh or by um, Raleigh and Diamondback. So what was Torker LX and whatnot, Raleigh and Diamondback now own that name. And we decided at that time that we're not able to really resell them. So you have all these brands that we used to carry and we would deal with their warranty problems and their stuff that were like, hey, your saddle could be like this and your psych, you know, you should do this tire and you should do that. And we got tired of them saying, yeah, OK, we'll consider it. But then they ended up not doing anything. They're like, if it's not broke, don't fix it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So what we did is we said we got tired of trying to help them out. So we decided at that time, let's make our own brand. So to give you an idea. Uh, our club unicycle brand is a medium price point line. And when we built that cycle, we had the intention to be somewhere in the price range of the CX and the LX, but be at the level of LX wise, you know, for use, but we didn't want to necessarily copy them. So that's why we use the Nimbus horned frame for a, for a foot grab. And then we offer colors in that. And then we have the trainer line, which is like the, the boring round crown look to it because it's just, you know, we see that so much. We want it to be more spicy than what it is, but you, it's like the round crown is the strongest by design and it's just simple and it works as long as you're not doing foot on frame tricks or if you have mad skill, like a handful of guys out there do, you know, they'll hook their foot on anything, any kind of surface and be able to coast and one foot ride and whatnot. And, and then our Nimbus is our main lineup. That is um, not that, that the, the Nimbus mountain unicycle was originally in that $300 price range. And that cycle killed the $1,200 hand built custom us made unicycle. Cause mm. before Nimbus kind of came along with their mountain series in the 24 and the 26, then um you, you could get a, a nice Muni with an, uh, you know, American made uh, rim from Warsaw, Indiana, like a Sun Ringle. You could get a Rick Hunter frame or a Vortex frame. You could get DM cranks and DM hub or um, uh, profile racing, like I had talked pre you know earlier, profile racing crank set and hubs just by itself was $300. Then you had to pay to get it laced into a wheel. Then you had to have a frame around it. And the frames usually ran around three to four hundred dollars, depending on what you wanted the frame to be. So, the that Nimbus kind of killed that medium market and brought it to be, you know, more attainable for everybody to afford one. And and then what was it? Uh, then later on, we ended up buying Impact Unicycles, which is more of a flat and a and a, and a extreme trials lineup and uh that was a brand that yogi the guy that started it and founded it um he loved the brand he didn't want to see it go anywhere um but he wanted to pursue a, a professional career in engineering to which where he came from so through that we decided to not let it die and we ended up purchasing that program there that that lineup from him that brand so you know we're yeah, gonna so have to so for a lot of our listeners obviously um 
aside from myself and you, I doubt that any of my listeners have ever ridden a unicycle. So I'm going <laughs> to define a couple terms here for them. So Muni is a, a short for mountain unicycle. Yeah, sorry about that. Which is what that. people have done. No, no, I, I've got a story. I'm going to segue this. It's all going to be good. And trials are more like street. If you've seen trials biking, mm-hmm. uh, it's more like street off obstacles in a city off an urban type environment. Muni is mountain unicycling, off-road, downhill, and a uh, single track type environment kind of thing. So I, I, I have a good story about this. So here's how I got into unicycling to begin with, totally randomly. So I yeah. turned 16, which um, pretty much right before you came on board. So all mm-hmm. of the de- developments you're talking about is basically my life with unicycle.com. <laughs> so I turned 16, and of course, the expectation is American kids, they get a car when they turn 16. That's the idea. So my dad gives me a, a, a card. I'll never forget this. On my 16th birthday, it's a school day, and I open the card, and the front shows a picture of a car, and it says, I couldn't afford to get you four wheels. I open the card, custom card, and it says, but I could only afford to get you one instead. Look in the garage. So I look in the garage, and there's a unicycle. I had never mentioned unicycles. I didn't (laughs) ever talk about it. I had never expressed interest in it. I was like, this is a thing from the circus, right? So I... I probably have 15 minutes before my ride to school is coming, and I think I'm just going to get on this thing and I'm just going to ride it. So I remember, like, holding on for dear life in my garage, Mm -hmm. trying to go three feet and not being able to do it. And then the determined perfectionist in my brain, like you said, I was like, I've got to figure this out. So it took forever before I could go 100 feet. And I think the first time I went 100 feet, uh, I couldn't do it again for another three hours. It was just, like, some fluke. And then I was so frustrated. But eventually, you know, the weeks or months, I can't remember how long it was, you're, you're going a mile. I went around the block for the first time after maybe a month, mm-hmm. I'm not sure. But you start to get these crazy ideas in your head, and it was a cheap little crappy traditional unicycle, whatever you'd find, mm-hmm. probably 100 bucks max. So you get the idea, like, there's a curb here. What if I just keep riding at this curb? And what if mm-hmm. I go off the curb? And you try this, and it works. And it worked one time. Um... But then I quickly realized that this circus unicycle was not designed for any of these new things that I was trying to do. I looked (laughs) on the forum. I tried to jump. I snapped my crank Mm. immediately the first time I tried to jump. So then you look, okay, I need something a lot tougher than whatever the base model is. And then I started finding it out. And then you get into this whole world of like, because there's only one hub and you have these two cranks physically attached to this hub, there's no gear system, there's nothing, Mm -hmm. there's no shocks that are possible. So you're putting just tons of pressure on parts that normally on a bicycle don't have nearly that much pressure on them. So you need these incredibly strong uh, cranks, incredibly strong everything. And... It was very much a, a work in progress at that time because in unicycle.com, like there were, you could see that there were flaws. It was such a niche industry that they would say, oh, this, these cranks are good, but the hub is not good enough, or you're right. going to wear the, the bolts on <laughs> this combo. So I had to upgrade. And I remember the first time I got, I spent like $400 on a unicycle, and my parents thought I was absolutely insane. Like, why on earth would you do that? <laughs> And then I'm starting to go down mountains and stuff. So it's it's just right. the stupidest hobby that anybody could ever have. But it's so addictive in a weird way. Oh, and it's so niche. It, it and it is. And I tell people the char, borrowed from Charlie Dancy's book, which I think is very comical, but it is so true. Like what you're saying to our to our sport is the bicycle is the most efficient human powered device ever invented by man. Yes. And then you flip the quarter and you go to a unicycle. And according to his words, it's the most idiotic form of transportation <laughs> ever invented when it comes to efficiency. But it the great thing is, is now you fast forward to our lives nowadays. And I'll get a lot of people that will over the years that say, hey, you know, my doctor told me to quit running, but I like to run this three mile route. And then you get some people that say, oh, I like to cycle, but that, you know, I can't, I don't have time to ride 35 miles. I don't have time to ride an hour to get that, that good cardio burn because of it being so efficient. So the great thing is, is if you take our 24 inch unicycle or anybody's 24 inch unicycle and you ride that same three miles that you jog, it's the same. Once you know how to ride, mind you, 
that's the same cardio burn and the same exact timing because the pace is the same, but it has no shock. Like if you were to run or jog that three miles and, and so, and a lot of people are looking for that quick half hour workout and that's where that unicycle fills the void. Now, now if I backpedal a second and say, okay, if you want to learn how to ride the unicycle to the viewers out there that might be intrigued on that crazy idea, because it is crazy. It's even crazier trying to think we have a job selling these crazy things that are only associated with circus. Um, But, you know, if you get a unicycle, 20 inch or 24, depending on your NC measurement, you practice 15 minutes a day. Most people have it within two to three weeks. They'll have the basic skills like what you were talking about, riding around the block, be able to go about a football field. Then you will be immensely irritated because you can't free mount the thing, meaning yeah. mounting it unassisted. I know it took me like three months. I could literally have my pinky on the hood of somebody's car, yes. but that's what I needed to get up on the thing. Um but when you start riding that unicycle after that two to three weeks, like what you were saying, I love it where you were saying, oh, yeah, I wanted to roll off the curb, yep. which is the easy part. It's like a right. controlled free fall riding down the yeah. hill. But you're like, oh, uh-huh. I want to ride down that curb. And then you're like, I'm tired of getting off the cycle and stepping up on the curb and then looking for a mailbox or looking for something so right. I can get back up on the cycle. And then so let that, me jump you know, up. Let I me said, jump. the you know, yeah. I, I tell people I was born a mountain biker. And the great thing about riding off road, once you know how to ride the unicycle and probably why it took me three months to learn how to free mount it is there's trees in the woods (laughs) and there's also sticks and rocks on the ground. So you fall over and we call falling over an unplanned dismount or UPD for short. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's another avenue that makes it fun. And then the great thing is, is I've noticed when I've ridden normal tired unicycles versus a nice mountain unicycle that has a three inch tire that circus song that people see when they see that unicycle, man, if you add a three inch tire or you put a, you know, run a, like our hatchet unicycle, yep. which I'm responsible and for, for making that cycle happen sooner than later for unicycle.com. Uh, you know, they see that they're like, that circus song doesn't even come to mind. They're like, Oh my goodness, look at that unicycle. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's the, well, that's the great it, thing about unicycles. It speaks to, anything in the world that humans can do, they're going to take it to the most extreme level, whether it's yo-yoing or chili eating and witnessing this and the birth. What's kind of cool about these niche things is that you can develop along with them. When it's a small company, you can provide feedback. You can say, hey, this broke and let's fix it. And there's this kind of collective blossoming of the concept as people go further and further with it. And Oh, yeah. For me, you know, we started, I had two buddies and we were all hooked together and um, we started going downhill and we started going off road a little bit. Then we started, we, we lived in Colorado, so we eventually bought uh, passes to go up the gondola and Steamboat oh, Springs yeah. and we started riding. We were the first people ever to do that there. We didn't have brakes or whatever and they were freaking out about it because we didn't have brakes and we told them, no, 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 we don't need a brake. Our legs are right. the brake. You literally can't coast in this thing. <laughs> And I had to explain the physics of it before they would let us go up, and they were so confused they let us do it anyways. Right. But it culminated. There was this thing. I don't know if you remember this or if you heard of it. Is there still something called Moab Muni Fest where they go to yes. Slick Rock? When I, okay. when I attended it in 07, yeah. Mountain, Dew, Mountain Dew came out and actually sponsored the event. And, um, yeah, they, they had over, I want to say at least 200 or if not 210 wow. people, I think it was one of the biggest years. Don't quote me on it. It might've sure. been 2007, 2008. That was the biggest years. Yep. Um, but, um, like what you're saying with, with, um, spe- steamboat, um, I think it, oh, it was 07. So 07, I rode down Pike's peak, wow. um, on, on my 24 inch unicycle. I will never do that again on a 24. I will grab <laughs> yeah. a 32 or a 36. I couldn't sure. walk straight for three days. Any kind of incline where I was walking down, my legs would just give out. It was Shot. crazy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, watching, that- like, to give people a sense of what people have done with a unicycle at these times, and it's only gotten more insane, but there was this oh, guy, yeah. the Michael Jordan of unicycling. I love, like, the Michael Jordan of anything. Chris oh, yeah. Holm. Oh, yeah. Chris, Chris Holm, Holm is the Michael Jordan of, or the Tiger Woods <laughs> of, you know, or at least oh, yeah. he was. I'm sure there's other guys yeah. now, but at my time, he was the man. And I watched him at Moab Muni Fest do things that you would say are totally impossible on one wheel. 
There was a, there was a challenge where it's, they said, okay, how long can you stay totally stationary on a dot, not moving at all? Maybe like a, track was it, a four, yeah, tra- on a four inch, six inch dot. So I think the next closest person was maybe sixteen seconds. The runner mm-hmm. up in that challenge was sixteen seconds. I watched him sit there for minutes on end. Oh yeah, he was just yeah. in a league of his own, jumping twenty feet off of built, like jumping off of tall buildings, off of rocks. Oh, yeah, just stuff he, that boggles the mind. And, and how far and, people have taken it. And I can't remember if Chris coined it or or whatnot, who said it, but it's true with unicycling, like what you were explaining, like, oh yeah, I want to do this and I want to do that. Um, the key is with unicycles, if you can walk it, you can ride it. If there's if there's stones that are going across the river that's like eight foot long or eight foot wide, and you can hop physically with your feet on those rocks, you can do that like on a trials or a 20 inch unicycle or even a 24, but you have to have your mental game. If you can physically do it, you just have to mentally say, I can do that. And you can stick it because unicycling really marries the physical of, yes, you can do it. And the mental, uh, I know I can do it, but do you have the mental mental toughness to literally jump up on a trash can and then ride a six foot high wall and then jump off of that. And even, even walls that have six foot or even a four foot drop on one side and they're level with the ground on the other side or like two inches, even riding walls like that perspective wise, it's like the higher you get, the more shady and the scary. more, uh, you're, you're, yeah, scary. Cause it's like, if you biff it, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the bad. Bill and you don't yeah. want to, but yeah. it was like, yeah. you think about it. When I started riding, I never thought to walk on a handrail barefoot or anything. But then once I started riding unicycles, you view the world through a different lens, like a playground, like you're driving through a new town or something. You're like, oh, I'd hit those stairs. And oh, look at that bench placement. And look at that ledge. And you look at it as a playground. And every unicyclist I've talked with, especially when they're looking at riding a trials or even a 24 inch and and dancing between the two where they're wanting to do more hopping, but actually still get to places um, you view the world through a different lens. You're riding in the woods on a mountain bike and I'll see a downed tree. I'm like, oh, that's totally ride- rideable on, on the unicycle. Probably on the bike, but my game isn't as tight on the bike. I like the unicycle because the only, you're babysitting one wheel versus, you know, I'm steering the front wheel and the rear wheel, hopefully, you know, you can get it to catch and follow the same line kind of thing. So that's, and that's the other thing that's about great about unicycles. And then the other advantage is if you have a bunch of friends that fit in the car and they all ride unicycles, if they'll all fit in the trunk of the car, you don't need a fancy rack. And then if you have like 10 that you want to take, take the pedals off and they stack like cordwood Mm -hmm. and the maintenance, you know, two sealed bearings, you keep the spokes tight on your, on your wheel. You make sure you keep your pedals tight. You know, maintenance is nil. Now, now that bike, you know, now that bikes had brought in uh, the disc brakes and streamlined that and brought the price point down, uh, Nimbus brought on disc brakes, uh, probably the first manufactured, not not first by any means in the, in the realm of unicyclist.com, but we were the first probably production run of unicycles, which born our Oracle, because before then, Nimbus always wanted to be steel frame and just bare bones, functional, and you know, you hop on the unicycle, you go, and it'll hold up to almost anything. So when uh, the disc brakes kind of came to light, We were like, let's do something totally different for the Nimbus brand and let's unveil it with the 36 first because that's where the the disc brake would be good for. Um, You don't need to have a brake for a unicycle, but what the brake enables you to do uh, for mountain mountain terrain and whatnot, it gives you control to be able to slow down when you're going downhill and it's ruddy and rocky. Now, for a road unicycle, whether that be a 29 uh, or even a 26 or a 32 or a 36, is you can run shorter crank arms so you can um, have control going down the hill. And for people that are interested in unicycles, they're like, well, why would I want to run shorter crank arms? So with unicycles, the bigger the wheel, the faster you go. It's kind of like boats. Each boat is designed with a certain haul speed in mind. You can put a bigger engine on the back of the thing or a motor. It's not going to go much faster than what the haul speed is designed for. Same thing with unicycles. You go to that bigger wheel, you're going to have 
that that's going to be a, essentially a speed that you go and you believe it or not go the same speed up a hill as you do down the hill if you feel confident with it mm. so to have the control going downhill let's say without a break you want to have like a 150 millimeter crank arm or a 165 or a 170 but some people are like oh i want to cheat that which we can if you cheat it mechanically you can go to a shorter crank arm like a 125 millimeter is pretty much a lot what a lot of people go to some extreme guys got to go shorter and you dance that fine line of not having the control but being able to go fast um but like let's say you go to a 150 when you start riding your 36 or 32 and you're like oh i want to go faster then what you do is you go down to a 125 mil crank well, if you start going down a hill, that crank isn't going to give you enough leverage. You can't even stay on the cycle, let alone try and slow it down. It'll just start going and, and keep going faster. And then eventually you'll fly off of it and you'll have to chase it like a half mile down the road before it hits yeah. something. Um, but that shorter crank allows you to spin it faster. Uh, mm -hmm. So like a three inch circle is way easier to spin mechanically where you can do like 120 revolutions per minute versus that you know, 150 crank or you're, let's say you're, you're pedaling a five inch circle, it, it takes way more effort and your body has to move a lot farther. So that's, that's the concept and why somebody on the road would want to run a shorter crank arm sure. and then in turn need a break to keep that cycle speed in check. Um, so it's very cool. Obviously, things have come a long way in the last 10 plus years. The technology is insane. So I, I want to zoom out a bit here now. Yeah, um, yeah. And I am very fascinated with the idea of turning a hobby or a passion project into a business, making something out of it. And I think for a lot of people out there, because it could be anything, it could be knitting, it could be, it really could be anything. Oh, yeah. But as long as there's a passionate group of people, there's a market for it. And I wanted to kind of talk about the business. How did it start? So obviously unicycle.com, a top level domain, as they say, you know that that's early because there's, those don't yeah. exist anymore. They cost right. a fortune. <laughs> right. So I'm assuming that it wasn't just a, let's just buy this because it's a dictionary word, but it began with a passion. And I'm, I'm guessing yeah. John Drummond also played the banjo at that time. Yeah, yeah. So maybe guide us through the steps you have an idea, you have something that you're passionate about that maybe not a lot of people are, or you feel that there's an area that's underserved in the world. You say, I love this, but something's just not quite right. How do you turn this thing or this passion into a successful business? Well, usually for that, you want to, I, I would probably say you pretty much throw common sense, out, normal business con, com, common sense out the window. You want to clean, you know, you want to, Hang on to it. I was not involved early on. Sure. Um, but I can tell you timing is is where unicycle.com, to have unicycle.com and to be where we're at now, it was all timing because that was in the infancy of the dot-com age for one. And then, yeah, having the passion and taking something that you physically like and saying, I want to make a living on it. Um, now, my passion is cycling in general, but I love unicycling uh, equally as much as I love riding my fat bike out in the snow like I did this past weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but when you do, a, uh, the first thing that you probably want to do when you choose a job that is your passion is you throw out the window that you're going to make billions and billions of dollars, because especially a hobby type job. You do it because you love it and that's the reward. So what is the next step? You want to get other people involved because you know other people will enjoy it as much as you do. So when I talk to a customer, for instance, I'm like, we all, for unicycle.com, if you don't ride a unicycle and you start with our company, you're strongly encouraged and you're given time to be able to practice it because of the relation to, you know, if somebody calls unicycle.com, that's what we do. We want to do, you know, we want everything unicycle. You come to us, we try and give you the best resources. So I guess setting that up, you want to get a game plan and say, what do I want to do with my hobby? What do I want to do focus wise? And, and run, that, run with that. that. Essentially, that's where the mission statement would come up to. And that mission statement is one of the pieces you need to convince a bank into giving you money. You know, if you don't have any kind of money to start with, you have to have money somewhere to start something like that. 
Um, there again, unicycle.com started as a resource for unicycles. Then out of requests that started selling unicycles. And then you start with, you know, something that was just time invested information. And then it was, okay, yeah, we might try and get those cycles. And then you start fulfilling orders and trying to get this stuff and sign on to be a dealer to get other product. Then the next step is, okay, what are we going to do with this now, now that this animal is growing? Since I've been on board, we've slowly got away from selling other people's product for whether they sell out, they get bought out, they get discontinued or whatnot. But we saw being a passionate writer, we saw loopholes of they're not doing this right. Okay, well, if the customer breaks this hub, the hub we make is designed for strength and it has a certain width for a reason. So that reason makes our cycles better and stronger. Somebody else has this other cycle if they need a replacement hub. Sorry, that is an older design that we don't believe in because of this. And so you go from literally reselling to making stuff. And then once you cross the line into making your own product to your specification, then the hard part is Marion, let's make the best design product, but we have to hit certain price points. You can't mm -hmm. get around it. Not everybody can afford a $600 unicycle. Mm -hmm. Not everybody needs a $600 unicycle. And I'll be the first to tell somebody, hey, do what you can afford. And, and if like what you're saying, if, you do what you can afford and you wreck it a month later because you're hopping or jumping. Okay. You need to step back and say, I need to mow a couple more lawns. I need to hustle something else or sell something so I can afford to keep doing the hobby that I want. But as far as selling the, the turning point for unicycle.com, I would say is when we started doing manufacturing out of Taichung, mm -hmm. Taiwan, that really gave us control over our branding and kind of more, you know, extended the vision beyond what probably John originally had. And the reason for that is because now we have control. Now we can pick what tires we want. Um, what was it two years ago, three years ago, I tested 20 something fat tires to mm. find the right tire. But then you go back to Taiwan. And the problem is, is, oh, this tire that I absolutely love. Oh, we're sorry, we can't get that in Taiwan. Well, we could get it in the U.S., but we want to be able to offer that same exact cycle in South Korea um, or in Denmark or, um, or Sweden or UK or Australia. So for us to be able to do that, we have to be able to get it out of Taichung, Taiwan. Uh, that's where we kind of keep all our factories and all our manufacturing out of. So we're like, OK, well, we'll take the top four tires and which tire can we get out of Taiwan? And we ran with that tire for a little bit. And then unfortunately that company had discontinued that a tire. So we had to go back and test some more, but that's the kind of stuff that I do. Roger does, you know, Amy will do. We, we just unveiled an air saddle, uh, a, a little side funny story about how we do manufacturing. So when I was a customer of unicycle.com, there was a thing called an air saddle. I remember um, those. Yeah. It, 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 in my opinion, I, I got it and I got the kit from unicycle.com and it was a jean sack with an inner tube shoved right, in just, it. Right. It was just you an inner tube. In it. Yep. Yeah. And you stick it and you stick it into the saddle cover. Well, the I problem remember. with the air the problem I had with the air saddle was that it moved around. If you had enough air in it, to kind of support the cover, it was too much air and it kind of felt like a jiffy pop, you know, popcorn box. You're trying to sit on it and running around. But then if you let enough air out that it felt awesome and comfortable, you'd hit a bump and your butt would hit the bottom of the saddle, which necessarily was like bolts that, you know, if you have the carbon fiber, it was bolts that were duct taped over, you know, so you're hitting the bolts and stuff. And so I took athletic tape and I laid out the tube to control the, the to control it better and found out athletic tape over duct tape or any other tape was the best, but I still couldn't get it dialed. So I was like, you know what? I'm probably doing it wrong. I, I, you know, I'm learning. So I ordered one from unicycle.com and it was actually worse than anything I than came up with made, at the time. Oh no. And we joke, we joke about it. So in the, in the couple of years, we've always wanted to do an air saddle. We ran off across a guy, I think it was in 2011 or 2012 at the show that does air bladder systems. And we were working on redesigning the saddle base for Nimbus and Impact. And 
you know, that takes three to four years in development. So we work on stuff ahead of time and we're like, oh, I want to tell the customer that we got this, but I can't for one for confidentiality. And for the other thing is it's not going to be available for like two years. Cause once we make it, but well, then we got to do samples, we got to test it and we got to look at pricing and then we got to test it and fix the problems that, that come up and whatnot. So fast forward now, uh, what was that, 2012, maybe 2013, we first discovered this air bladder system. Now, fast forward to 2020, that was when we actually came out with the Nimbus Air Saddle. Now, what is the difference between the Nimbus Air Saddle that I purchased as a customer of our company to the one that we have now? Oh, the one that we have now is an air bladder that's specifically molded for, in the shape of a unicycle saddle. And we found that uh, having a tunable one was not really well received and not that great. Actually having one that is sealed is great. And then we had the idea, somebody, I'm not sure who at the moment because of it spanning so much, we were like, what if we trimmed our foam down and encapsulated that in foam so it had more support? Then you have both worlds versus just an, instead of just an inner tube and that's all you get. And so once we did that and we started testing, it was a lot more comfortable well, the original design that the guy had was actually just a cover, like an old school gel cover you would go to Kmart or Walmart and pick up and, and whatnot for a bicycle. And we were like, ah, that's not where we want to go. But he had, was so excited about the project that he had done the tooling for that product already. So we decided to keep that on. And that's kind of a fraction of what we do relationship with our companies you know, the frame manufacturer, we're not flippant with our relationships. We go to the factories. We've actually eaten dinner with some of the families of our factories that, you know, we know them at, you know, at fate, you know, we see them, we hug them, you know, in normal conditions, you know, we're over sure. there. They're, they're like a part of our family. So if there's an issue, we don't say, oh, we're done with you. We're going to a different manufacturer. We're like, no, let's see where the problem is. Let's fix this problem. Let's work with you because we, we both need each other. And, and that only benefits the customer because you're not, oh, this is running. And, and we can't control all the running changes when you start making your own product. But as we learn to make it better, we try and segue those running changes that, okay, this is better. We've changed it because of this. It doesn't make your cycle that you have now bad. This is just we've learned and the like in manufacturing for bikes. Things get better. Things get cheaper. And honestly, unicyclists benefit from that because then it makes it attainable for us to be able to produce it because we are a small company. Mm -hmm. You know, the U.S. the U.S. is a five to six man operation and it's about the same in the U.K. and all the other unicycle.coms worldwide are one to three people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we look like a huge company. But honestly, we're not. It was that timing of the dot com that gave us that mm. that visual of a big company, but really just a mom and pop company that got lucky, really passionate about our sport and understands the sport and really wants to serve our customers the best that we can. And that's all you can do. I mean, why do you pick your hobby? Because you love your hobby. You're passionate about it. Well, if you're passionate about it, you're thinking about it when you're taking a shower. You're thinking about it when you're driving and running errands. You're like, oh, if we did this, this would be great. Oh, I like that color on that car. Can we get that color on a frame? Uh, probably not, but at least we can try. It's an idea. But I mean, you know, you think about that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, there's like you double have a double bolt seat post clamp. Well, we came out with a quick release double bolt and people are like, oh, that's silly. Why would you want a double quick release? And it's like, well, you're riding a unicycle. That's silly enough. Why not? And it's like, <laughs> All right. you know, people love this, the quick release because you don't need a tool. Well, the problem with the quick release is it doesn't have enough gripping power, like the double bolt clamp to, to grip that seat post and keep it from moving. And so I was like, well, why don't we do a double quick? So that was another project that took four years. And you should see the first one. The first double quick, it looks like a brick. But that's how prototype stuff works. But, you know, like the 32 and the double quick and the air saddle, that's all stuff that, you know, we listen to our customers or we personally want it like the double quick. That was personally something I wanted. I wanted that personally. And I was like, if I want that, I know there's at least 20 customers out there that want that because they're unicycles too. And they think about that stuff. Disc yeah. brakes. Do you need disc brakes? No. Rim brakes work just fine. But 
hey, this brakes have advantages as well. So, <laughs> so with that, to kind of focus and go back to your original question, you know, how, I think what it is, is come up with a bomb-proof mission statement from what I've learned and um, understand you, you may not make millions of dollars, but your worst day will be your best day working a job that you absolutely don't like. And if your passion is excited, like I get excited talking unicycles. And, and so that will pass on to the customer and you both are, you know, out to enjoy the sport. And, and when you do the manufacturing, you have the control of your own product and you can make it better. You can choose to not do anything and just make whatever, you know, and do it that, you know, by all mel me, you know, all means, but it's one of those things that it's like, you got to ha- keep, you know, going with the changing of the times, if there's something wrong or if there's something that could be better, let's do it. You know, like right now we'd like to do to move into the tubeless market, like the bicycles. Mm. Why tubeless? I was a slow adopter in the bike industry for tubeless. But once I started doing tubeless, it's amazing the friction that happens between the tube and the tire. Even if you telk it up really good, there is a little bit of friction and you notice that rolling. When you go to tubeless, you have to put fluid in your tire. Um, That keeps the integrity of the tubeless from letting the air out because there's stuff that's inside the tubeless mixture that will coagulate like your blood and fill those holes or that's how it's ideally supposed to work. Um, And when you roll, you get less friction. You can run lower air pressure with tubeless and not get a pinch flat. You might damage your rim, but usually what happens is if you run that lower air pressure, you have more control. You feel more connected. You don't have any friction that that is really hard to explain without you really having one side by side and riding one. You just, it feels a little slower, um, and and whatnot. But you know that's the next thing that we would like to usher into mm-hmm. is making unicycles tubeless ready. And Chris Holm, you know, you name the Michael Jordan of unicycles. Yeah. Um, you know, Chris Holm, he um, has, I want to say, 75% of his product that he s- sells is tubeless ready. The rim is absolutely a beautiful rim. It's a 55 mil rim, so it is really wide, but it gives a good footprint. Um, and it's a great tubeless rim. I actually have a set of those rims on for my bicycle, one of my bicycles, wow. uh, because it's such a nice burly, you know, tubeless rim. Um, but I think that's, you know, one of the many things that are, are going forward in the, in, in the unicycles, you know, to come mm-hmm. um, and other stuff, you know, like just expounding on, you know, the crank arms and offering the multiple holes. Chris kind of debuted the double holes, which have been, you know, it, like record changing as far as the market goes. Um, being able to not sw- carry your crank arm extractor and a spare set of crank arms. Cause I remember doing that on my first 36. Oh, there's a hilly section. Let's take the crank arms off and the pedals and, you oh, know, switch really? the crank. Wow. Oh, I yeah, never, take, that never switch, occurred you know, to go me. Go from one fifties, cr- okay. you know, where you need them for hill climbing. And then you get to a That's flat crazy. section. You're like, Oh, I want one twenty fives. So you take like, a, you know, 10 out. minutes. To switch that out where a pedal wrench simply does that, where um, Roger came up with the idea, let's do triple holes. Let's redesign our crank arms and do a triple hole and offer three popular sizes. Well, those have gone so well that we're actually going to be releasing, I think this summer, July, a new triple hole for the Nimbus brand that's going to be the 170, 150-ish, might be 148, and then the shorter 125. That way you got two sets of cranks that handle the longer side of things and the shorter side of things, the 150 being kind of like the, the center line. So, and for road and mountain riding, that will fit the bill for freestyle. They still like the 125 to 75 millimeter crank arms. So well, I'm detecting just insane amounts of passion from you, my friend, which is exactly what we, which exactly, you know, <laughs> Thank you. it speaks volumes to your interest. And uh, I think that is going to impress itself on all of the listeners to this episode. Um, and it seems clear to me that in this time, there's a pandemic. A lot of companies are failing. A lot of companies have had the worst year ever. What I have noticed kind of doing this show and talking with people is it's the companies that have a base in their community and a connection with a strong community that make it. And the fact that Unicycle.com has been there for so many years and you have all these innovations, this can only happen because of the community 
that you're a part of. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. And the interest, um, we've been out of stock quite a bit because all the spreadsheets that we, you know, painstakingly do and sit down. And that's the other part of your question previous, not to jump back to that. Um, that's so crucial is QuickBooks and like account keeping. If you don't have somebody, if you're not good with accounting, if you need somebody that's key that can do the accounting, because that honestly is the underdog that really makes or breaks the company. Because if you don't know where you stand company wise, financially, inventory or whatnot, you, you know, it can sink the ship super fast. Um, just, you know, even with the government not paying your taxes, well, they only let you get away with that so long and then they come <laughs> find you. Yes. Um, but so so that's crucial to kind of seal that that question up a little bit is on what you kind of have to have a game plan going into a, you know, a passionate business. Just because you have the passion doesn't mean you know how to count. You know, counting is just as important as that passion that fuels it. So sometimes you need to have somebody that is good at counting and maybe not as passionate but the passion helps. So in, in, in that going forward to where like what we're dealing with now is all the sporting industries. People are at home. Some people have the money, some people don't. And they have a lot of idle time on their hands or they like sports or they're looking for new challenges in sports. We have found a surge like the bicycle industry where honestly, since 2015, cycling in general has kind of slumped a little bit. And so people had adjusted their, their products and adjusted their volume to match that. And then all of a sudden 2020 happened and everybody's wanting to buy a bike mm. and everybody's wanting to buy a unicycle. And it was one of those things where we sold out of all our product and we're like, where did this come from? A prediction sheet and, and just guessing on what we're going to sell based upon three years worth of records that we're trying to track to order appropriately and have a good uh, stock level, but not ha be so heavy in stock that you can't buy other product because your money's tied up with product on the shelf. So we try and strike that balance. Ha ha ha. Cause we're unified. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't uh, put sorry, enough puns you know, in this thing. No, that's my bad. Right? I should have been sprinkling um, them in but, left and right. <laughs> but, but, but when you look at that, I think it was sports in general. I don't think it was necessarily privy to us being out of stock. But um, now you go to COVID shifts uh, for the manufacturers so they can only have half the workers. And now they got twice the workload getting thrown on their lap. Well, that the workers have to assemble stuff, right? Well, that material is doing the same thing. So that material needs to be ordered. Uh, there's a bike company called Salsa that a lot of people will probably recognize. So to give you an idea, it might. this is just through word of mouth in the industry, so it's not, you know, factual, but to give you a rough idea, they do their orders in two years. So when they get product in, it's two years worth of product, according to their spreadsheets. Mm. They got their product in, I think it was in May for the next two years. If I remember correctly from what they were saying, that product sold out by the end of June. That's wow. two years worth of product. That has never happened. So now... They weren't going to do any orders. They didn't have any spreadsheets like we all do. And so they were like, oh, well, now we got to get re back in line to manufacturing that we weren't even going to worry about for at least a year. And now we need to get product made again and make it available for the consumer to be able to buy it. So that is just a small picture of what the entire bicycle industry is doing. And I know other industries are having that problem. It's like computers. I've read an article about computers, how you know, they've had that same surge and you go to like new egg and you're like, Oh, I want that computer chip or I need that cooler fan or whatever They're And they're out it's because everybody else needs it. Cause everybody's sitting at home playing on their computers. Cameras too. All of so. it. Well, I want to get into, I, I mean, I thank you so much for your time up to this point. Oh, you're welcome. Very great chat. Um, I want to do a couple rapid fire questions. I have the first one. I think I know yeah. what your answer is going to be, but <laughs> live to work or work to live. Oh, work to live. I, I, I always, I always tell people, I, I always, I always have, I have two adages. My one main adage, cause I grew up on a farm and so I work hard, I play hard and I try and stick to that as much as possible, regardless if my body is on board or not. <laughs> and then the, and then the other, the other thing is, you know, we're born to play, born to ride and forced to work. <laughs> 
I like that. I like that. Um, okay. Uh, what does the future hold for you personally the next 10 years? Any idea? Oh, I, I, I hope that I'm still pedaling. Mm-hmm. Now what, wh- wh- what, it's probably going to be fat. I'm, I'm, I'm the, you know, if you talk to anybody that has known me in the last 15, 20 years, they're going to say, oh, he likes those fat tires. They make up for what you lack. They give you that, Im- that, that imagination. So I would say, I would love to see myself riding more, you know, as much, if not more, we always like to do more, but sometimes it's not real realistic. I'd like to see my son ride in, and me and my son doing more riding. Oh, he yeah. isn't riding. How, how old is your son? Yet. Oh, um, he just turned 11. Okay. All right. And, so he's, he's and, getting there. He's in that sweet oh, yeah, spot where he he's about ready bike. to go. Okay. I gave him a choice. I'm building him up another fat bike. I said, I, every time yeah. we get to that junction, I'm like, do you, do you want normal tires or do you want fat? And he's like, mm. no, I want fat. And I'm like, okay. All right. And and he's had some interest in unicycles, but I told him, it, you want to do it, we'll do it. If not, you don't have a choice in cycling, but you do have a choice, at, you know, specifically what genre you want to partake. But I would like to see more, you know, bike packing adventures with him and getting him involved in more and maybe unicycling, you know, I can uncross yeah. my fingers. Um, and, you know, job wise, uh, you know, I love my job. Uh, I, 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 it's one of those things where I'm like, man, I'm like, are we missing something? I really want to come up with the next thing. What what can we do to unicycles that's only going to benefit the customer? What can we do? So whenever I'm thinking of that, I'm like, you know, what is there? You know, and like the disc brake thing, we, st- you know, the bike industry and, you know, streamline that. Disc brakes for bicycles have actually gone back to the 70s, if you really follow it. Shimano made a hit or miss, you know, not so good version but you know, really, what bicycle the bicycle industry has? How can we adapt that to work well for unicycles, and not just to change it to change it, but to change it for the better to benefit the me and our customers as a rider? So honestly, ten years from now, I, you know, I'd love to be still working at Unicycle.com and, Sweet. Um, you know, having things streamlined and having stock again of, yeah. of all our <laughs> unicycles, so we can have some on our showroom floor. Because right now, it, yeah. there's like one unicycle on the showroom floor. So great. All right, and to cap it off, I always like to ask this: What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? For a beginner or for a unicycle already? Just, you know, I'll leave it open or life advice. Oh, well, however you I choose work, to interpret it. Since I, since I work with a lot of the people interested in unicycling, and that's probably the audience that we're speaking to, sit down on the saddle. Just tell yourself to sit down and let the unicycle go and your legs will propel it as long as you sit down and just take the load off. And, and, and I think that applies to other things, you know, in life, because when you're in the beginning and you stand up and you take all that pressure, as you, pro- as you, as you well know, off of your saddle, that's when the cycle wants to fight you. And that's when it's shooting out from under you. And that's when you get the most mad. That's why I tell people 15 minutes a day, that's more than enough. And some days you got good mojo and some days you don't. But that 15 minutes is enough that you won't throw it through your neighbor's window. (laughs) So really what it comes down to is sit on the saddle and let the unicycle support your weight. And then your muscles will relax and then it will listen to you. And, and, you know, you want to go forward, you go forward. You want to go backwards, you go backwards. And practice, 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 because that's how you get better. (laughs) Well, you know, I got a feeling that there's a deep metaphor for life in there somewhere. And maybe oh, you're going to write sure. that book. Maybe your book is going to be Zen and the Art of Unicycle Maintenance. Maybe that's the <laughs> next thing like, about balance, right. <laughs> taking it right. easy, perseverance, not giving up. Um, but again, thank you, Josh, for taking the time. Really a pleasure. Um, it's just always okay. great to chat with somebody who's so passionate about what they do. Oh, thank and, you. you know, to show people that if you take something far enough, there is a way. I think that's so cool. Oh, yeah. If you there take is. something serious enough and if you just love what you do, that's certainly my takeaway from this whole thing, that there oh, yeah. is a path forward for you. So I think, I hope that that will get a lot of people thinking about some good new I, stuff. So Yeah, I hope so. Maybe, cool, maybe, man. maybe they'll be interested in a unicycle or maybe they'll follow their passion and start something. I mean, and getting your feet where, wet. It, where should they find you? Where can they support oh, you? So obviously well, unicycle.com, yeah, we're, we're but where unashamed, else? Yeah, unashamedly, you know, yeah. unicycle.com. Uh, I mean, yes. we're pretty much there. So that that and we have all kinds of resources. We also offer live chat. 
um, and, you know, email and we sell them worldwide. So it's, it's, yeah, we, we, we breathe and live unicycles. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So, well, thank you once again. And with that, the uh, podcast is officially over. Sweet. Thanks for listening to the Beat the Off and Path podcast. If you've been enjoying this show, please like, comment, share, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to me on YouTube. It would mean the world to me. Also, do you have an unusual success story or do you know someone who does? Well, please recommend them to me. They could be a future guest on this show. Maybe they've rolled the largest boulder down the mountains of Tibet. Or maybe they built the world's largest chicken farm in Madagascar. The point is, I don't know what I don't know. So I'm looking for inspiration and unusual success stories. So help me by being a part of this adventure. I'm looking to grow this podcast with you. Thanks again for listening. 